Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Hall. I'm a marketing coordinator for ALS North America. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our Webinar Wednesday series. Our presenter today is Dr. Stuart Lebrun. Dr. Lebrun received his bachelor degree in biology from the University of California, San Diego and his doctorate in toxicology from the University of California, California Irvine. He was a fellow at Stanford University for immunology and oncology and a fellow at the University of California, Berkeley for cell and molecular biochemistry. Dr. Lebrun's major focus of his research has targeted methods development in the area of non-animal toxicity testing. He has conducted and studied the toxicology and biochemical mechanisms of a variety of diverse test systems, which include ex vivo bovine, chicken, and rabbit eye models, as well as other eye irritation tests. Currently, he is focused on translating this understanding to the development of more predictive methods for accessing toxicology potential without using live animals. Now, Dr. LeBron serves as a toxologist for our Bioscreen Laboratory in Torrance, California. Today, he will be discussing in vitro test methods for assessment of eye area cosmetic and personal care safety. During this presentation, feel free to use your chat box, ask a question, or raise your hand feature. To ask questions, we will answer all of these at the end of the presentation. Stuart, thank you again for taking your time to deliver this presentation today. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, today, I'm really excited to talk about an area where I've been working for almost a decade, and we want to talk about uh, some of the progress we've made. Uh, um, first, a little bit of an overview. We, we do routine testing, a um, couple hundred uh, ocular tests every year, and we have a state-of-the-art facility with dedicated uh, rooms for each of the different types of tests, hazmat, uh, capacity, et cetera. And we, we conduct tests for eye safety, skin safety, acute toxicity, amongst others. But of course, today I'm only going to talk about eye safety testing that we do. As well, um, I'm involved in, in, in addition to the routine testing that we do day to day, I'm involved in a couple of research projects to try and develop this field further. So we've developed an in chemical test, the OptiSafe test that I'll uh, touch on. Um, we are developing an ex vivo test that I'll talk about. And on another front, we've developed some differentiated uh, skin models for testing. But we're going to talk about that today. So today we're going to talk about ocular irritation testing. And ocular irritation testing is important for the identification of chemicals and mixtures that cause adverse ocular effects. And this is routinely done to ensure that materials are appropriately classified, labeled, and meet regulatory and safety guidelines. Um, I'm not a regulatory specialist, so we're not going to talk too much about the regulatory, just touch on that briefly. So what is ocular irritation? Um, ocular irritation has a very specific definition. Uh, we look at specific target sites in the eye, the cornea. So does the cornea become opaque? Of course, the cornea is a transparent outermost layer of the eye. We'll look at a picture in a minute. And if it becomes opaque, then uh, vision is compromised or uh, blindness can result. The, well, Another target site for irritation is the iris, so the ciliary muscles that form the pupil, and of course a conjunctiva, which most people think of as irritation when the conjunctiva becomes red, inflamed, uh, takes on a crimson color when it um, discharge results. And we'll talk about a very specific definition of ocular irritation measured either by the Environmental Protection Agency uh, classification system or the globally harmonized classification system. And these are a little bit different. Um, the EPA system is looking at a threshold at 24 hours. So the first time point that matters is 24 hours if you get one of these adverse effects. Whereas the GHS system is an average over the first three days. And both of these regulatory classification systems have a threshold that is a rather high level of irritation. So ocular irritation is not just slight redness, uh, 
an hour or two before. And in fact, immediate effects caused by things by like alcohols or acids that then uh, fade before 24 hours are not considered irritation, They're, that's sting. So we'll look at a little bit more at these target sites. So the, the, the cornea is the transparent part of the eye that is doing the first focusing of light before it hits the retina. And it, can, it has a outer epithelial layer, an inner stromal layer, and an innermost endothelial layer. The iris is these ciliary muscles here that form the pupil. And the conjunctiva is the white part of the eye, this heavily vascular part of the eye that uh, can become red and inflamed. So looking a little more deeply, here's some work I'm doing uh, with a collaborator, Dr. Jester at the UCI Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. And this is uh, ex vivo tissue. So this is just leftover waste tissue from the meat industry. And here you can see the cornea, and you can see the epithelial layer uh, shown magnified here, and the stromal layer and the endothelial layer. And notice that the epithelial layer is only about five to six um, cells deep. So the eye has considerably less protection than, for example, the skin, which is hundreds of cells deep. And once a chemical injury enters into the stromal area, this um, transparent region, which is made up of collagens and crystalline proteins to maintain transparency, can become opaque. And here's an example where we added a, a ocular irritant. Uh, this is the application site. And you can see mechanistically what starts to happen. In this particular staining protocol, we stained green for live and red for dead. And you can see that the epithelium has started to peel away. And then, then there's death down into the stroma. And these results, th these kind of um, biological responses to chemical injury are what we see as uh, swelling and opacity and redness. So I'll talk a little bit about the history of ocular safety testing. So this really started with John Dray's in the 40s when the FDA was interested in ways of evaluating chemical warfare agents. And he developed the Dray's test for both ocular and for dermal irritation and corrosion. And the, the animal choice was model, was, the animal choice was the rabbit because um, rabbit eyes are very similar to human eyes. And uh, since, since this time, this test has become the, was for many years, the gold standard. However, um, now we're left with it as a gold standard to which our, since we're no longer doing animal tests or we're trying to move away from animal tests, um, this is now the gold standard to which a non-animal non ocular irritation test is compared. And this um, standard uses a clinical scoring system uh, based on external effects of cornea, iris, and conjunctiva, as already mentioned. And the, the scoring system uh, identifies a threshold response, which is a rather high level of damage to the eye. And then the severity is determined by the number of days until it reverses. So here's an example of this kind of data. And um, we, we don't do any animal testing. This was just taken from the web. But this is an example for a soap, a 80-20 tallow coconut oil. And you can see the, um, the corneal response, the iris response, and the conjunctiva redness, chemosis, and discharge are uh, clinically graded. Um, the first relevant time point is one day, and this goes up to 21 days. And for example, uh, 
discharge for this one has an average of less than uh, two over a three day. So by the GHS system, it would be um, non-significant. So you do need a rather significant level over the first three days for the GHS classification. Um, reversibility is determined by the number of days uh, or, or severity is determined on the number of days till it reverses. So in this case, it, this animal did not reverse. So this one would be identified as an ocular corrosive severe irritant. The uh, traditionally a an average score or a modified maximum average score was used to give a score. However, it's um, it's difficult from a regulatory perspective to use a, a graded score. So the modern uh, regulatory classification systems use this data a slightly different way, which I'll go through in a minute, but um, the, the EPA system uses the most severe single animal from the study, and the GHS uses the two out of three most severe. So, so now um, the old MMAS has been replaced by the globally harmonized system or the environmental protection classification system. So it's important we kind of talk about these a little bit. Uh, let's start with the GHS classification system. So the lowest classification for the GHS is not classified or NC. And what this means is that over a three day average, there's no significant irritation. And these would be uh, score, rather high score, scores of two um, for, for conjunctival redness, for example. And then once this, if this threshold is met, then it's further classified, the severity is further classified. If it reverses by seven days, it's a 2B. By 21 days, it's an A. And if it never reverses, it's a CAT1, severe irritant corrosive. So the GHS system is mostly used for labeling when to use eye protection. And it allows what an average person would call an irritant. You wake up the next morning, you have red eyes. Um, but this would still be classified as a non-irritant. Um, so it, it, it excludes, um, it, it takes a rather high level of irritation over the three days in order to reach that threshold. However, it's the world standard for product labeling for international commerce. So um, it's, an, it's a very important uh, classification system. It's the internationally accepted classification system and like I said, it's mostly for when to use eye protection. On the other hand, the EPA system uh, has a lowest class of four, which is no significant irritation, 24 hours after exposure. And this is probably more appropriate for cosmetics and personal care products. Um, a consumer who uh, wakes up the next morning with red eyes, ex severely red eyes, will say it's an irritant. If that persists for uh, longer, they'll, they'll not be happy with it. So the, the threshold for the EPA system is significant irritation after 24 hours. And then the, the degree of irritation is again determined by reversibility. So if it reverses uh, by seven days, it's a category three. By 21 days, it's a two. And if it never reverses, it's a category one. So as I mentioned, the EPA system is more appropriate for cosmetics and personal care products. Um, however, the, the lowest class still allows significant contractile irritation um, as long as they reverse by 24 hours. So if, if you have uh, redness the first few hours, it's still considered a non-irritant by the EPA system. And it still allows conjunctival scores of one. So slight uh, bloodshot eyes would still be classified as non-irritants by the EPA system. So let's transition a little bit and talk about why do a non-animal test. So this, the, the, the Dray's test, the rabbit test is, has been criticized for inconsistency. So on the example that I showed, the three uh, within lab 
repeats uh, don't match, but even more so the between lab uh, repeats, the reproducibility um, is quite high. And this has to do with the subjective sort of clinical grading of the responses. And it's also has a limit ability to predict materials that are toxic to the human eye. It's a rabbit, not a human. But most importantly, there's widespread public opinion against the use of animals for routine product testing. Um, last poll I saw over 70% of Americans uh, would not use a product tested on animals. So there's a, a significant um, grassroots public opinion, but also there's now um, bans, worldwide bans on the use of animals for routine product testing, a range of countries, most of Europe or all of Europe, about 15 other countries across the world. And the US um, is now proposing bans on animals for a wide range of routine testing applications. In fact, the uh, a new law, the California Cruelty Free Cosmetic Act, which will take, which will be enforceable after uh, January 1st, 2020, will ban the sale of cosmetics if animal testing was used to determine the safety of the product or its formulation by the manufacturer. So this means that the, US, the rest of the US is going to have to follow suit um, and likely will thereafter if they want to sell into California. So talk a little bit about chemical mixtures because products are um, complex mixtures. And of course, there's uh, reasons to test for labeling, labeling and regulatory requirements. Um, but also I'd like to say it's uh, for cosmetics, it's really, testing is really essential for quality assurance and quality control to protect longevity and brand. And what I mean by that is that products that irritate, especially eye area cosmetics, um, usually have a short uh, uh, product cycle because consumers quickly understand that that product or even that brand um, are associated with adverse effects. So ensuring that, that uh, cosmetic and eye area products are non-irritants is important for, from that perspective. Also, um, as sort of a general QA, there are supply line errors. So uh, there can be mix-ups and ingredients can become adulterated by if the formulation or other steps uh, due, to, due to human error. And the toxicity testing phase is a really good place to do that QC to determine if, um, if, if there's somehow an unknown or toxic ingredient has worked its way into that formulation. The other thing that um, I think is, is really under uh, recognized is that raw ingredient purity um, is is an essential it's essential to QA the raw ingredients because they're purchased at a degree of purity so a 99% pure would be um, rare actually and but there's still 1% impurity usually it's 95 or 90% pure and we found that um, it's very common for the impurities, the 1%, the 5%, or 10%, to be the source of irritants or toxins. And, and so we've, we've, we've uh, done a number of studies where we trace the, the toxin to that impurity. And this can change from uh, lot to lot, from supplier to supplier. And the only way to really determine if uh, there is a toxin as part of an impurity is to do some kind of safety testing. The other thing is um, natural does not equal non-irritant. Um, natural products very often um, contain uh, bio strong biologically active molecules. Plants have developed to defend themselves from animals and they can develop very potent toxins. And so if you're working with a new natural product, it's necessary to also look at whether it, whether it contains eye irritants um, in, in that new product. Um, and the other thing is, is prediction of mixtures um, 
mixture of toxicity from just the individual ingredients list is difficult. One example is, for example, an ingredient which is a ocular non-toxin um, may be so because it does not enter the target site. However, if there's um, if there's uh, lipids in this mixture, then that's going to facilitate the absorption the entry of that molecule into a target site where it can exert its toxic effect. And really only a small number of combinations of doses of chemicals have been tested. And, and when a formulation is made, chemistry is happening and, and new uh, potentially toxic molecules are created. And so mixtures can behave additively, so they can do what you might expect, but they can also behave synergistically or unexpectedly that in fact there's anti-irritants. Anti, um, so some ingredients in a mixture can actually protect tissues of the eye um, by blocking or other kinds of mechanisms like that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the advantages of non-animal testing. So I think the, the main one is, is ethics. So um, we, just no longer need to subject animals to uh, up to a 21-day uh, painful process of having something uh, toxic or corrosive put into the eye. I am a toxicologist. Toxicologists are known for working with animals. However, I no longer work with animals. Um, I believe that for routine testing, it's just unethical to uh, do extensive animal testing. And then also, of course, brand identity and sales. Um, the not tested on animals has an impact on that. However, there has to be a balance. So on the one side, no animal testing. On the other side, the negative consumer experience associated with irritation from a product. Um, so how do we reach that balance? Well, we we want to replace animals with scientific validated tests, tests that work. So I'll talk about a few of the different tests we do here in the laboratory. Um, first, just sort of some, some nomenclature. Typically, all of the non-animal tests are called in vitro. However, strictly speaking, in vitro means in glass and, and refers to cells and differentiated cells, layers of tissues. However, we sort of group under that also ex vivo. So this is meat industry waste. So normally um, parts of the animal are not used and there's no associated uh, increased animal killing or pain or anything associated with using this small section of tissue. And we call that an ex vivo test. Or there's also in chemical test, which means there's there's no cells involved. It's a strictly a chemical type of analysis. So how do you evaluate if a test is good? Well, there's uh, two considerations: application domain. What does the test? Uh, what kind of results are you going to get? And accuracy. So let's talk about application domain does the test measure the right thing? As you'll see, di the different tests that are available to us right now measure different um, levels of irritation. They, they, they work best uh, for a different level. Uh, we went through the severity that either a, an NC or a four or a corrosive, these are all uh, require a slightly different testing strategy. Um, and and we now know that certain tests have limitations related to uh, overprediction or underprediction of specific substances. So test selection uh, depends on the application domain so that um, we make sure we avoid testing the wrong thing. Um, also a consideration is what is being tested. So typically for um, industrial applications for safety data sheets or indication of when eye protection would be required. A overclassification is acceptable because that's an environment where that's standard practice and it's it's easier enough to, um, to require people to wear personal protection. However, for cosmetics, personal care products, we don't want uh, underclassification. 
uh, we don't we want to make sure that all uh, irritating uh, products are not applied to the eye area but we don't also don't want over classification because we don't want uh, good products which are non irritants to be falsely uh, identified as irritants the other consideration is how will the result be used um, so I, I touched on this previously. Given, given the range of non animal tests that are available to us, a single test may be in a, inadequate for a complete safety determination. Um, this requires an in-depth analysis, and it depends on the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of the test. And there may be a need for additional tests. So let's talk about um, these things, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. So this is the sort of statistical way of determining if the test is good. Um, of course, accuracy is the number of correct results, correct uh, being that match the gold standard, in this case, the Dray's rabbit test, uh, which we don't do, but is uh, still the reference. So the number of correct results over the total number of tested, Sensitivity is telling you the number of irritants detected over the number of irritants tested, and specificity is the number of non-irritants detected over the number of non-irritants tested. So, in other words, this is telling if you catch the irritants, this is telling if you catch the non-irritants. Generally speaking, um, sensitivity is more important um, to avoid chemical injury. So I'll talk about a few of the, of the tests we do here in the laboratory. Uh, the in chemical test, epi, I mean, in vitro test, epiocular, the ex vivo test, the bovine corneal opacity and permeability test, the egg test, het cam, and the in chemical test, OptiSafe. So let's talk a little bit about epiocular. Epiocular is a tissue model of the human corneal epithelium. So, um, Again, here's one of our um, um, histology pictures of ex vivo tissue showing the epithelium, and below is a stroma. And here is the epiocular test matrix. You can see they've reproduced the differentiated cells of the epithelium. And these are in um, tissue inserts, which are grown under uh, tissue culture conditions in a sterile environment. And this test has been developed to predict the GHS NC, and it measures a percentage of cells which are killed off by the test article. And it does this by a change in a vital dye. When uh, the cells are alive, they turn this dye purple. When they're not, they don't. Um, so let's look at an example of that. So the uh, construct is is, is pre-incubated, the test article is applied, and then there's an extensive wash, and then the MTT reduction step is done. So here's an example showing viable live cells in the purple color that they've turned the dye, and these are non-viable cells after an irritant, showing that they're, these cells are unable to reduce this dye and turn it purple. Then these results are read on a, a plate reader and compared to controls, and a prediction model uh, looks at whether uh, greater than 60% uh, of the cells are alive. If they are, then it's considered a non-irritant. If they are not, it's considered a, well, non, it's considered an NC. If not, then it's either a, it's one of the higher levels. This test only differentiates between uh, NC versus the rest. It doesn't differentiate between um, the reversible irritation or corrosive irreversible irritation. So the accuracy of this test um, is about 80% with a high sensitivity, 96%, and a moderate specificity. And one of the things that we're going to see is that most of the non-animal tests have a moderate specificity, so they're very good at, at predicting whether something is toxic, but there are there is a false positive rate. And I'm going to suggest later that 
there is a case to be made when you get a positive to do a confirmatory test or further analysis in order to ensure that it's not a false positive. So next I'll talk about the bovine corneal opacity and permeability test. So this is a test that just uses leftover eyes from the meat industry. So there's, there's um, many, many um, eyes available that are normally wasted. And we take these um, fresh uh, eyes from the meat industry and isolate the cornea and measure uh, the opacity after test article application. So does the cornea turn opaque? And then the permeability, which means has the tissue started to fall apart such that a vital dye can move through the cornea. And then these measurements are used to calculate a IVIS score, which that then is used to assign a, class, a irritancy classification. So let's talk about how we do that. So here's a here's a mounted cornea. This is sort of where we start. You can see the cornea in this chamber. Um, a baseline opacities uh, measured with a opacitometer. Here's a picture of one. Um, the test article is applied and washed off in some cases. If it's, uh, if it's a liquid, if it's a solid, it's left on. And then the substance is incubated under organ culture conditions for a couple of hours. And then the uh, final opacity is determined. And then the difference to, uh, is how the opacity score is obtained. And then a vital difluorescein is added into uh, one of the chambers. And if it passes from one chamber, you can't quite see the other chamber, but this is this is a two chambers separated by the cornea. If the dye moves through, um, then that is a measure of the permeability, the change in permeability of this cornea. And then that is measured on a plate reader. So then these results are used to develop a, a score. Here's the equation for it right here and related to a prediction model. Um, this test predicts uh, not the GHS non-classified, but it also predicts the category one corrosive. And one of the things is um, it, these um, accuracy numbers differ quite a bit depending on what test, I, I'm sorry, what study you looked at. Um, here's one recent study where they showed a sensitivity of 90% specificity of 70% for overall accuracy of 86%. Uh, previous studies have shown a slightly uh, lower specificity, but they've done some improvements to this procedure. Another test that we do is the, the Henzeg chorioamnionic membrane uh, test. And this uh, is an interesting test that uses uh, eggs and at, at day nine, it's still an egg. And what happens is um, as the beginning steps in, in development are an air cell forms and a, and a chorionic membrane, uh, this heavily vascular membrane uh, forms across the top before the embryo really starts to even form. And these vessels look very similar to the vessels of the eye and can be a testing matrix we're looking at conjunctival effects. So um, the, the top of the eggshell is removed, the test substance is applied, and then we look for um, whether the vessels have lysed, whether um, a little bit of blood has come out and coagulated, or whether a lot of blood has come out and there's uh, hemorrhage. And then these, at, at and we look across several time points, and then these variables are combined to calculate a score and relate to a prediction model. Um, here's a uh, couple of uh, validation studies uh, for this um, by ICFAM, US agency. And for the GHS system, the accuracy was about 70% with 100% sensitivity, but a rather low specificity. And specifically over prediction of alcohols. For the GHS, uh, this was the GHS, for the EPA system, the accuracy was a little better, sensitivity of about 91%, but still a, a low specificity. 
So now I'll talk about the tests that we developed. Um, this is OptiSafe, and this is looking at purely the destru destruction at the molecular level. So we have a, a range of surrogate molecules, which represent the different molecules within the eye, things like collagen, um, things like uh, phospholipids. And this test measures the ability to, um, if a test substance damages these molecules, which make up the eye, then that, rep that determines if those substances would also damage the tissues of the eye. And this test, um, we call it OptiSafe because it's optimized safe, and you'll see why in a minute. It gives a range of different results. Uh, it gives a GHS NC in one, EPA four in one. And then we also have a unique non-irritant classification. So as I was mentioning before, even the EPA at 24 hours uh, may may classify as four certain things which a consumer may feel are irritants. Um, one of the things about this test is that all the materials are derived from non-animal sources. And so it was developed for regulatory, it, it does the GHS and EPA, but also for cosmetic testing because it does the, the mild moderate range as well. So the OptiSafe category is very similar to the GHS. It has a corrosive, which is the same as the GHS-1. It has a, a moderate, which is the same as the 2A and 2B. But it also has this mild class, which is predictive of conjunctival irritation at, uh, at 24 hours of, of a 1 or greater. So remember, the EPA uh, looked at 2s. We feel that 1 um, bloodshot eyes is still a significant uh, prediction for cosmetics and personal care products. So the OptiSafe non-irritant is a true uh, non-irritant, so they, they fall um, below one at 24 hours. This is how we do the test. So we developed this um, with cosmetics in mind. So we have a um, analysis of the physio pro physiochemical properties of cosmetics, which are quite challenging for a number of tests because cosmetics tend to be uh, highly colored, sticky, viscous, uh, difficult to work with. So we do an initial pretest procedure to determine an optimized set of uh, biochemical tests. Here's an example of one of those tests. The, it's done in a 24-well plate. The test article is added to these um, these membrane discs, which represent one part of the eye, and then below it is a another agent, which represents another part of the eye. Um, this is a rapid test. It um, takes an 18-hour incubation. After that, the optical density is measured and compared to a set of controls, and this is either accepted or rejected based on if it passed quality assurance and an irritancy prediction is made. So the entire test is complete in about less than 24 hours. Um, this has been a great experience for us going through the validation process with the government. Um, so we received a phase two SBIR grant for this, and we have a, a pending publication, and I think uh, Adam or Kelly could provide you a reprint if you wanted. This was overseen by NYSEDM and ICVAM. So the ICVAM is a congressionally appointed party which has representatives from all the different government agencies, the FDA, EPA, consumer protection. And Congress developed this, uh, this regulatory body so that these different representatives would feel confident in the validation of specific tests and recommend them uh, within their agency. And for this, ICMAM developed a study plan, selected what chemicals, and did the evaluation. And in the National Toxicology Program coded chemicals and sent them to three labs. And this was done in, um, in triplicate uh, by three labs during the transferable inaccuracy phase. And those results are shown here. So we had a 100% sensitivity, 71% specificity, 89% accuracy. 
Uh, in the final phase, a much broader range of chemicals. Uh, many that were missed by other tests were, um, I found out after the fact, were given to us, and that one had an accuracy a little bit lower, about 80%. But uh, um, we have always had for the GHS system 100% sensitivity, so this is apparently the most sensitive test. Um, in the second study, not with ICVAM and the government, we compared Epiocular with OptiSafe um, for the EPA classification system. And here's an example there where, again, OptiSafe has 100% sensitivity. Epiocular uh, has a slightly lower sensitivity for the EPA classification system. Uh, however, it has a, a higher specificity. Uh, but the overall accuracy of OptiSafe is about 95% for this study. So, so I've kind of talked about a few of the tests that we do, and the question is, which one do you select, and how do you do that? Well, um, Scott et al. proposed either a bottom-up or top-down approach, and, and bottom-up means that you test things which you're assuming are non-irritants. Top-down is that you're te first testing things that you assume are irritants. Most cosmetic and personal care products we're assuming they're non-irritants, so we do a, a bottom-up kind of approach. And de deciding which um, test you want to do depends on uh, what endpoint you want to evaluate. If you're interested in labeling purposes and uh, export-import, then it's the GHNC class. If you're interested in um, the consumer experience, uh, what at 24 hours, um, is a person going to say it caused redness? Then it's the EPA class. So let's let's so, so you would start at one of these two levels for a bottom-up approach. If you want to make sure it's a non-irritant, um, you could do the OptiSafe or the HEPCAM. If you get a negative result, then it's a true non-irritant, and you're done testing. If you get a positive result then you know it's an irritant, but you have to determine to what extent of an irritant. So you can do a, a second test to look at the GHS and C class. You could pick OptiSafe, Epiocular, BSOP, or the Isolated Chicken Eye. And this is going to tell you that eye protection is not required if you get a negative. However, if you get a positive, then it's necessary to further differentiate whether it's a, it's a severe irritant or a corrosive. So a, another test is recommended. Um, OptiSafe or BCIP, if you get a negative, then you would need a label as eye protection required because, because it's, a, it's a GHS classified. And if you get a positive for a corrosive test, then label as corrosive and um, use that information as appropriate. Um, another important consideration is sort of the weight of evidence approach. So, you know, we are, we've made big strides in the capabilities of non-animal tests, but it's, um, it's quite difficult to model with a single test a, a whole organism. And so it's important to not only consider results from a single test, but also the uh, a sort of a full risk assessment. So the, the substance type uh, if there's any human exposure data, and probably results from multiple non-animal tests, especially if you're trying to subclassify, and considering the limitations of each test. So we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide, I think. And then also the intended product use. Is this something that's going to be purposefully put in the eye, put around the eye? Are we looking at a, a potential spill or accidental exposure. So these are all considerations which are combined with the test results to make a final risk assessment. A single non, I, I said this already, but a single non-animal test is likely inadequate for a full risk assessment because non-animal tests have limitations. So if you want to sort of think about the pros and cons of the different tests, so the the big pro for the BCOP and Epiocular are that they are have an OECD guidance document associated with them. 
So the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development is a, a, a body of that has represent, representatives from every country, and it develops um, guidance documents which all countries can agree on for the purpose of import, export, and international trade. So this is an important consideration in, in selecting uh, for export, for example. Uh, these tests, uh, most of them are, are validated. Um, but another consideration is what does it detect? So the BCOP detects NC and, and corrosive, epioclor only NC, um, OptiSafe NC, and corrosive. And um, also later I'm going to introduce some advanced methods which are just research only level. So there's a, a set of uh, cons associated with this, and I just putting that that these tests don't detect the 24-hour irritation; they detect the three-day irritation. Um, most of the tests cannot be used for some substances, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in all cases, uh, positives need to be further evaluated uh, by a confirmatory test and to subclassify because of this overprediction rate. Um, so here's uh, some of the things that we've learned by from validation studies by us and by others that you get false positives for specific chemicals. And so we went through and we identified as many as we could and made a list and we can work with clients to look at the ingredients lists to make a, a better uh, test selection based on known uh, false positive rates for the specific test that they're considering. As well, the false negatives are important consideration. So um, we've done the same thing and there's uh, false negatives associated with these different tests. Um, we, we haven't found any GHS false negatives for the OptiSafe yet. So just kind of transition, talk about the future of ocular irritation testing. Of course, we would like to replace animals with validated and accurate tests. And the current challenge is reversible irritation. So you might have noticed that we have tests for NC or category four, and we have tests for corrosive. And the only way to get the reversible irritation classification is by triangulating it with tests on either end. In the future, we'd like to develop a test which um, measures all the full range of irritation from non-irritant to corrosive. So we're doing a little bit of uh, research on this with um, Dr. Jester at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. This is the uh, depth of injury model. So this is a model that uses an ex vivo tissue. I showed this already. Here's a, a normal. Here's an area where a ocular toxin has been applied. And we're looking at how mechanistically the cells are responding and dying off and how that relates to the irritation response. So we, we worked with um, them with Dr. Jester to develop a prediction model to relate this to the EPA and GHS systems. And what we found is it determines um, all levels of irritation. And it also identifies a target of damage, why there is irritation. And um, so this is still in research uh, phase. We have a, a publication pending and we can provide reprints if you're so interested. Here's an example of this data. So uh, here's an EPA classification showing, um, again, the, the live epithelium and live stroma for a category four, the lowest EPA class. And then what you start to see is for the CAT3, you get this area where the cells have died off. For a CAT2, you have a, a much more significant area. And for a CAT1 corrosive, the entire uh, cornea has been killed. And of course, CAT1s are associated with irreversible damage or, or loss of vision. So um, that is about it. Um, we can stop now and see if there's any questions. Kelly, were there any questions? 
Yes, thank you, Stuart. Um, we will go ahead and open it up for questions. Please remember to use your questions box to type in your questions, or you can use your raise your hand uh, feature to ask your question directly uh, to Dr. Lebrun. We will give a few moments for everyone to do that, but we did have some questions already coming in um, throughout the presentation, so we'll go ahead and start with the very um, beginning ones. Um, okay, the first one's from Maya. She asked, will the law to ban animal testing be only for cosmetics, or will it be for the pharmaceutical topical as well as the prescription topical applications and medical devices follow also? Well, I'm not a regulatory specialist, but um, as I understand the law, it's just right now for cosmetics and personal care products. I think there's a big movement towards a, a more global ban, but um, right now I think it's just cosmetics and personal care. Someone may actually know more than I do. Um, I think I wrote down the law up here. So that's my best answer. I, I don't have a better one. I'm sorry, Kelly. No worries. Um, we, as you look for that, I do, there was another question. Um, um, if, if people submit samples to Bioscreen to be tested using the OptiSafe method, will they be allowed to use that logo and say that they have tested their products using the OptiSafe method? Sure, yeah. Okay. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, if a product is topical for the under eye area, will this test benefit the manufacturer to see if it, it irritates the actual eye? Um, so we assume that most things that are applied around the eye are ending up in the eye. And so, yes. Um, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, with with especially cosmetic creams, personal care products that are used on a routine basis, these these are definitely there is a level of eye exposure. Um, so yeah, it, it's necessary to test whether it damages the eye. We had another question from Doris. What do you recommend for ocular testing the safety of eye shadows with glitter? Um, I think in the case of, of eye shadows, um, either the epiocular or the BCLP test are good choices. We had another question. It says, with the new animal testing ban, would BCOP method be still acceptable? Yes. Um, so this is an area that that there's a little bit of confusion about um, whether whether the the cow eye test is an animal test. It's it's not considered an animal test. Um, PETA, for example, accepts it as a test, and it it meets the mission of they call it the three R's: reduce, refine, replace, and it it really hits the replace because this is a a waste product, anybody that eats meat, or even if you don't eat meat, there's thousands and thousands of cow eyes which are just discarded. So there's no, that using a cow eye to test as a testing matrix doesn't increase the number of cows that are killed, certainly not the suffering of cows, uh, because of the huge volume of, of cows which are, are slaughtered um, every day. So yeah, it's it's and and then strictly speaking, a a a tissue from an animal is not an animal. It's still just a, a tissue from an animal. So it's it's certainly a non-animal test. And we have another question from Maya. She says, "How does the cytotoxicity test relate to eye irritation test results?" Right. So the epiocular test, I think, is what is being referred to here. And so this test is modeling the epithelial layer of the eye. And if if th they have a prediction model, which they've aligned with the DRAES test results. So if it's 
um, greater than the 60% viability of that uh, differentiated cells, then they've determined that that would be classified as a NC, a GHS and NC. Um, yeah, so it's, it's for all of these tests, we've gone through, taken um, retrospective animal data. We don't do any new animal testing, but those databases are available. And then first um, optimize the test so that it, it is the best predictor and then do you know blind validation studies to get the accuracy. And so you can, when you look at those accuracy numbers, that's really predicting um, what a, what a, what would happen in vivo, what would happen to the whole organism, even though we're, the test just is measuring one specific variable. In this case, it's the, the live dead uh, percent of the cells. It looks like that was the um, last question that we had. Um, oh, okay. no, we had just had one come in. She says, um, this is also from Maya as well. Will the egg test ever become questioned if it is is an animal test? Well, the, the, the there's different opinions about that. Um, the American Veterinary Society determined that if you're less than uh, fifty percent of the gestation period, it's not considered an animal. And that's why we do day nine, because a uh, chicken is a 21 day uh, development period. So we, we are very careful to do less than 50%. So under that definition, it's not considered an animal. But the thing that um, is more convincing to me is that it's been demonstrated that there's no pain response of the developing tissue at that during those early development phases. So, so the, the embryo is starting to develop, but the majority of what's happened is the vasculature has developed in the, into the chorial amniotic membrane. And there's, there's no pain receptors. Um, it's, it's still at a stage where it's um, considered not an animal and a uh, uh, non, not really a, a developed embryo to any degree. Thank you, Stuart. I don't see any additional questions or hands raised. Um, I do want to thank everyone for attending our webinar Wednesday today. We do record these webinars and we post them on our ALS website as well as our YouTube channel. There you will find a wide range of video resources and past Webinar Wednesday presentations. Also, please follow our showcase page on LinkedIn. We post links to future webinars and other valuable resources as well. Again, thank you, Dr. LeBron, for your presentation today, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you.